Welcome to breadboarding. This is video 20 in the Nanocomp 6809 breadboard computer series. And in this video, what I'll be doing is looking to speed up the Nanocomp by replacing the current microprocessor with the 68B09 8 megahertz clocked version. The Nanocomp was a project originally based on a design in 1981 Wireless World magazine. And I explained in the earlier videos how we built this, expanded it, and then added a video controller to it as well, supporting VGA output. In the previous two videos, we've added a PS2 keyboard and added a sound controller and a digital joystick. And in number 20 here, what we're going to be doing then is upgrading the processor to work faster. If we just have a look at the chips that we're talking about here. So in addition to the processor, so this is the Motorola 68B09. So the B means it runs at a 2 megahertz clock cycle fed by an 8 megahertz crystal. We've also got the serial controller here. So that's a 68B50 and also the 68B21, so that's the peripheral interface adapter. So those chips need to be swapped out because they won't. the current ones won't be able to keep up with the faster processor. Now, the other interesting thing that I did come across, which I hadn't mentioned before, is that the CRTC controller that we've been using for the video card is in fact an Itachi clone of the Motorola 6845. But in fact, I've been using this HD 46505 reference when I've been looking up data sheets and things. But in fact, when I had this without the chip label on it, you can see the chip labels here either side for the, um, for the other chips that I'll be using, is actually a 68A45SP. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But what that does indicate is that it's actually not quite a B series chip, but it's an A series chip. So it is capable of going a bit faster. So I'll talk about that in a second. The 8 megahertz clock 6809 chips are the B versions that we've just seen. And there are two variants of the Motorola 6809. There was the basic 6809P, and the P meaning a sort of plastic packaging, and the E version. Now, the E version was designed more for multiprocessor systems or other complex systems, such as uh, using direct memory access for refreshing DRAM. The Dragon 32 and the Tandy Color Computer both use the 6809E versions because they were using the 6847 video controller. The two main clock signals which are used coming out of the 6809 are the E and the Q clock signals. The E one is the one which is used mainly for doing all of the chip timing. Now with the 6809P, this generates the E and the Q and those are outputs. Whereas with the E series, Series, we actually need to provide valid E and Q inputs. We also need to provide an 8 megahertz external clock, and that will mean that the E and Q signals then run at 2 megahertz. So let's have a quick look at the differences between the two 6809 versions. So on the left, we've got 6809P. So this is the version of the chip that we've been using up to now. And this has the two pins here for the crystal. So this is where the 4 megahertz crystal gets attached, and then Coming out of the E and the Q pins, we have the output of the one megahertz signal comes out of there. And in fact, these uh, signals are actually in what's called quadrature, so they're slightly out of phase. So effectively, they are one megahertz clocks each, but they are about a quarter of a cycle uh, out of phase with each other. Then when we look at the 6809E, we can see that these highlighted pins are different. And in fact, the main difference, most of these pins we don't need to use. So we can just sort of leave them disconnected or tie them to appropriate you know, ground or five volts. But what we do need to do is to provide input to the Q and the E, which are valid. Now the documentation for the 6809 includes this diagram. This is in the data sheet for the 6809. And basically what it shows is feeding an oscillator in here and it's actually got two of the 74LS76 JK flip-flops and there's also another flip-flop up here and this is used if you had slow memory so the memory ready MRDY signal allows the slower peripherals and slower RAM to be able to extend the bus cycles so you can see down the bottom here if the memory ready goes low then it's possible to stretch the EQ signals for the slower uh, peripherals and things now the main issue here is that the this particular chip, the 74LS76, uh, I haven't been able to find any of these anywhere. I don't think it's very 
easy to get these. Not sure why they stopped making them because they're in a lot of circuits. So what I've had to do is to try and find an equivalent of this. And I have actually wired in this uh, memory ready circuit should we need it, because this would allow us, for example, to allow the CRTC chip to have a slightly longer bus cycle should it need it. So what we're going to do is to actually look at um, putting that together on the breadboard and building the oscillator. But I just wanted to go on and have a look at the CRTC issue that I mentioned previously. So the CRTC was marked with the HD46505. So the data sheet that I'd looked at previously was in fact the Hitachi HD46505 and the data sheet, this is the data sheet I've used for the project up to now. And when we check in this and we look in some of the timing sections, we can see that in fact, we've got here that the clock frequency for the character clock is a maximum of three megahertz. And in fact, because we've been using 25 megahertz for VGA, it's actually running about 3.1 megahertz. So it's almost within scope, but it, it is running a little bit faster than it would otherwise need. And we can also see down here that for the read and write sequence times that really the E signal needs to be a minimum cycle time of one microsecond or one megahertz. So it's quite likely that if we were using this chip that it would really struggle if we have a cycle time of, of half a microsecond, 500 nanoseconds. So when I had a look at this other chip, which is in the same series, but is uh, compatible. You can see that um, for th there are two versions of this, the 6845S, and we happen to have a 68A45S. What you can see here, it's capable of running at 3.7 megahertz for the character clock, which obviously fits with what we've seen and we're running at over uh, 3.1 megahertz. I can also see down the bottom here that the A variant has one and a half megahertz bus timing and 3.7 megahertz character clock. So this would allow it to work at six megahertz quite comfortably. And then if we go further on into the data sheet, we can then see that the cycle times that we were looking at on the previous one, we've now got here 270 nanoseconds which is our 3.7 megahertz and that's absolutely fine and if we look down here under the a column we can see that the the e enable clock cycle time is now 666 nanoseconds and the minimum pulse uh, high and low is now 280 nanoseconds now the only issue is that when we actually have a look at the 6809b so this is the 6809b uh, sheet we can see that it says that the cycle time is going to be half a microsecond or 500 nanoseconds and the E clock signal could be a minimum of 210 or 220 nanoseconds. So really that's likely to be too fast. It's just a little bit too fast for down here. But we can also see here, this is the timing signal for the 6809. And this is showing where, where we have the E and the Q signals. Now, at the moment, the nanocomp is only using this period of time here when, uh, for when the address is valid and, and for reading and writing to memory. But in fact, there is actually this overall period here, 29 usable access time, is actually from when the Q signal goes high and when the E signal is high. So it's only this period really where there's no valid data on, on the buses. One of the things we talked about in earlier videos is we could actually modify the chip enable logic to make use of the Q signal and that would basically extend uh, this period here which at the moment would be of the order of half the cycle of this so about 250 nanoseconds and it would extend it to this time here and it says here that's about 330. 330 is more than 0.28 microseconds, 280, but it's still going to be on the on the on the edge of whether it will work or not. So, what I was going to do is to try it. We'll try it first of all with four megahertz clock, make sure everything works at four megahertz. Then we'll swap out the clock to eight megahertz, and if the CRTC controller doesn't work, then we'll look at these various things. So whether or not we can include the Q signal to see if that makes it work, and ultimately the worst case scenario is what we might have to do is there is a, another document that I came across 
generated by Motorola. And it's basically a document on using the slower one megahertz peripherals in a faster two megahertz system. To cut a long story short, it's quite complicated. And the circuit that you would end up having to do to do this would be this horror here. Uh, you may notice that there's some aspects of it. Um, this is using different, it's not using the 76, it uses the 74. But this circuit is substantially more complex than the one that, that we've shown previously. You can see there's the MRDY signal. It's actually got a, an oscillator circuit here. We'll talk about that in, in a minute. So really, there is an option that we've got here, should we need it, but it's really a lot more complicated and really I would like to avoid having to do this uh, complex one megahertz with two megahertz systems uh, extension here. So what you can see really is that the CRTC chip we're using, because it's the A version, it can work at six megahertz, but probably, perhaps not eight, and that's a 1.5 megahertz sort of cycle time and can also work with the 3.7 megahertz character clock. This might work with 8 megahertz, 2 megahertz. If we were to change the current chip enable from just using E to use Q as well, then that time goes from 220 nanoseconds to 330, which may be sufficient. And the worst comes to the worst. If that really doesn't work, then we may need to follow the advice in that document that I was showing. But that will make things a lot more complicated. So now let's look at the plan for this video. So to start, we're going to look at creating an 8 megahertz standalone oscillator, and we'll also try that with a 4 megahertz crystal. So that will allow us to test with a slower speed. If we try and um, change everything with the new circuit and the faster speed, we won't know exactly what's caused the problem. So then we're going to look at using that circuit that I've just shown to create the E and the Q signals from that crystal. Then we're going to plug in the B version with the E variant standalone, and we'll just wire up the data bus to 1-2 hexadecimal, which is the no operation instruction. And what that should just mean is that we can test that the process is working and the address bus should just go from the original reset vector all the way up to, uh, all the way through the address range as it cycles through. So then what we'll then do is to swap out on the nanocomp board, take out the current processor, we'll swap in the new one and then we'll hook up the EQ circuit from our board. Then we'll make sure that the Nanocomp keyboard and LED display, the serial port and the video controller are working at 4 megahertz with a new processor. Then we'll replace the serial controller, the old version of the chip, the slow version with the faster one and we'll test it at 4 megahertz. Then we'll replace the peripheral interface adapter with the faster version and test the keypad and LED display at 4 megahertz. Then once we know everything's working with the new processor and the new ENQ signal, we'll replace the 4 megahertz crystal with 8 megahertz and then we'll test the keyboard, LED display, serial port and the video controller at 8 megahertz. And then obviously if there's any problems with that, then we'll have to go and fix them. Now hopefully the video controller may work at this frequency, but it's quite likely that we're going to have to do some changes and we've already outlined those already. You may remember in the keyboard controller video that I needed an 8 megahertz clock and I tried to use my, my chip. There's a, a four pin oscillator chip that has the clock built into it and outputs a TTL signal. Unfortunately, that was faulty. I must have reversed the power on it or something, done something to it, and it wasn't working properly. Fortunately for the keyboard controller, it could just take a crystal with the appropriate other passive components and that worked fine. For this circuit, I've actually tried many circuits with the eight megahertz crystals that I happen to have, and I was getting all sorts of strange things. I know that crystal oscillators are a law unto themselves and there's an awful lot of theory behind it. Perhaps at one of these days, I might go into the, the detail of that, but I was getting all sorts of strange resonances of 34 megahertz, 16, seven, and, and it was generally quite unstable. So in the end of all the circuits I looked at, including I tried the circuit that was actually in that uh, low cost one megahertz peripherals document from Motorola and, and I had problems with that circuit as well. The circuit to the left, I've based this on blogspot URL there, which I include in the description below if you want to have a look at it. And this is basically using inverter Schmidt triggers with these values. Now this was of a 12.8 megahertz crystal. I obviously want eight. I'm using an eight megahertz crystal and also four megahertz. 
I actually found by experimentation that the 22 peak of ferro capacitor for the 27 and also replacing the 5 to 50 PF trimmer with a 22 PF seemed to work okay. I use the same values for the resistors. This seems to work and is quite reliable. It's a bit of a black art, I think, developing oscillators. I must admit, I might buy quite a few more of these clock chips. It makes life a lot, lot simpler. So I got this circuit working and then what I then need to do is to look at the logic circuit to generate the in the Q signals. Okay, so we're going to do the second step now and we'll also create the oscillator as well at the same time. So what I'm going to do now is just look at the circuit. So I've already prototyped this. What I will do is tidy this up and update the schematic diagram when we actually build this properly, but I just wanted to get this sort of up and running first. So the two issues I had, one is that the chip I had here, I actually used an HCT version, not an LSTTL version. Uh, the, the values I said here, the 22 peak are farad the same and the resistors are also the same. They're just the 4 megahertz crystal I'll swap out with the 8 just to see that everything works. Now this whole circuit I've put together very much like this. However, because I 74 ls the closest thing I found was in fact the 109. The 109 is not the same pin out, but it's a capability. So it's J and K, the only difference is the K inverted on the input. And so what this does mean is when we're doing this sort of here, that if there was a feedback, for example, for um, one of these... So if you just have a look at the data sheets for the 74LS76, there are two versions here, the 76 and 76A. We are dealing with the 76 here. And we can see here that it's got preset clear J, K, and then there's also Q, Q bar inverted. These flip flops do have slight difference. The positive edge triggered flip flop. It says when these values is loaded, when the clock is high and transferred to the slave on the high to low transition. So it goes from high to low and it transfers that. If we have a look at the 109. It's quite similar apart from you can see there's a bar on the K, which confused me to start with. I didn't realize that was the case. These devices in, can contain two independent JK bar positive edge triggered flip-flops. So I think they're both positive edge triggered. So they sh should be completely replaceable. I have no idea why the 76 is no longer available. It would seem to be quite a common thing, but uh, perhaps people could put in the comments if you know why the 74LS76 JK flip-flop is no longer available. So what I've done is I have, have wired up this. I've also hooked the output into the circuit here. And if we now go back to the oscilloscope, we'll actually be able to see this circuit working. So this is the oscilloscope software that comes with the and the tech scope. It's a bit basic, but it's uh, sufficient. So we can see here, this is the clock output from the second Schmidt inverter. And you can see here, the frequency is 8 megahertz, 0.125 microseconds. So it's fairly stable. That looks to be working okay. And then what I'm just going to do now is to hook the probe up to the J and the K input. So what I've done now is I've attached the two oscilloscope probes to the uh, outputs here. So the, the J over here is going to system Q and the Q output here is the E clock signal. So those are hooked in now, they're hooked into the eight clock. So if we now go back to the screen share, we should be able to see the signal. And what we can see here is now that we've got our two signals, you can see that these are two megahertz. So channel one is two megahertz. Period is, is half a microsecond, so 500 nanoseconds. Obviously the scope shows it as a bit messy, but what I will do in a minute is just have a look at these signals using the logic analyzer, and we'll hopefully be able to see the logic analyzer sees a nice clean signal. These are in quadrature, so they are at the right phase. So that's what the oscilloscope signals are showing. If we now go to the logic analyzer, if I just run this, it's running at uh, 200 megahertz currently. And if we drill down into signals here, we can hopefully see Along the bottom here, we have an eight megahertz clock. And we can see the period is 125 nanoseconds up in the top right hand side here. So the period is 125 nanoseconds. The duty cycle here is not quite what we'd expect. 
but that's probably partly related to the sampling frequency that we're using. But we actually have a look at the Q and the E signals here, then these are 500 nanosecond period, 2 megahertz, and they appear to be the right phase. What I will just do is if I increase this, this is my um, LA5032 analyzer, which actually can go up to 500 megahertz. If we actually run that signal and see what that looks like. So the clock signal there, you can see now that the period, rather than being 125 nanoseconds, it varies between 124 and 126 on the right here. So it does actually indicate that it's it's more variable, but in fact, it's because it's sampling at a finer grained level. But because it doesn't go down to the one nanosecond level, then it does vary between 126 and 124. Whereas if we go to the 200 megahertz, we actually get the period is 125 nanoseconds. So it's quite interesting. The sampling frequency on the logic analyzer can actually uh, determine what sort of uh, values and things you get up top here. But um, from the point of view of the processor, it only really cares about these two signals. So these appear to be two megahertz with the appropriate phase and the atope and the duty cycle, which is pretty close to um, 50 percent. OK, so I realised that um, we've done the testing with the 8 megahertz crystal here, but we also need to just make sure if we swap it out with the 4 megahertz one, that if we want to test the nano comp on the lower frequency, we just need to make sure that's working OK. Turn the power off. So this is the 8 megahertz crystal. Now we may need to tune some of the capacitors, but uh, I think this should just about work OK. It's close enough that it works. Okay, so now we've got the 4 megahertz crystal in there. Power on. And so now we can see we've got a 4 megahertz signal for the clock. And in fact, the E and Q signals are now 1 megahertz. So all this means is that when we want to test out the nanocomp with the new clock circuit and the new processor chip, we can test it out at 4 megahertz first so we can isolate whether the problems are caused by the new circuit or whether it's caused by the frequency we're running at. OK, so now I'm going to install the 6809E microprocessor and we're all just going to stick this on a separate card alongside. I'm not going to worry too much about taking the other power rail off. Just make it a bit quicker. So I've got the chip with its chip label on. So I'm just going to put that in so that it's a little more over this side and lining up the power rails. Just move it down a little. Okay. So now we're just going to wire in the important signals for this. So if we have a look at what that needs to be. We'll have to do the power, so that's VSS is ground, VCC plus 5 volts. We're going to need to pull these interrupt channels up to 5 volts. We could use a resistor, but I'll just wire those into 5 volts to start with. We're going to be putting the no operation code on the data lines. So what I'm going to do is going to wire the lines, which for a zero, just going to wire those, the 4.7K resistor to ground, and those ones want to be one, I'll wire it to 5 volts. And we actually want one two hexadecimal, which will be D1 and D4 will be tied to uh, 5 volts and all the others will be tied to ground. And that will make our microprocessor just cycle through the whole address range so we can just check to see if things are working. And we can see over here some of the signals are the same. So read write is the same, Q and E look the same, but in fact now they're inputs, not outputs. Reset is the same, halt is as well, but these other ones are related to the extended features that the E version of the 6809 has. And the main thing we need to worry about is the three state control in that we, if that is made high, that will disable the, the outputs of the chip. So we need to wire that to low. So what I'm going to do now is just wire in those. And we're also going to need to put a, a reset circuit on there. So it's very simple resistor and a capacitor hooked up to the uh, reset line so that on power on it takes perhaps 50 to 100 milliseconds before the processor comes out of reset.
So what I'm going to do is to plug those in now and then we're going to plug in the logic analyzer and we'll look to see whether or not we can get the processor to cycle through its address lines. So just going to wire up the power first. So we'll do ground first, which is VSS. And then VCC. That's plus five volts. Then we're going to wire up the interrupt line so that they don't cause any problems. So just wire those straight to five volts because we're not going to be doing anything else with those at the moment. Okay, so that's that. And we also need to wire HALT to plus five. If that goes low, it would cause the processor to stop working. And finally, the three state control. We also need to wire to ground, otherwise the... Let me get... Okay, now we also do need to put in a reset circuit. So what I've got here is a capacitor I think it's uh, about 22 microfarads. So we're going to wire that into between ground and then the 4.7K resistor then goes between 5 volts and there. And then we're just going to wire in the reset line to this. means that it takes about 50 to 100 milliseconds for the reset voltage to go above the level at which the processor comes out of reset, but it starts close to zero and eventually after about 100 milliseconds or so will come out of reset to 5 volts. They're just going to put the resistors in, so these will be a little bit fiddly, but they're going to go so D0, make sure we're getting the right one, so it's three address lines, D0, going to put to ground, D1, which is 2, is going to go to 5 volts. So that gives us our 2 value. And I got another two zeros. Zeros, then we need a 1. That should be D4. And this free running microprocessors is a common thing you can do it also with all other chips. You just need to find the no operation, no op code for the processor, and then by wiring the bus to the data bus to that value, then it should just mean that the processor will cycle through the address range. So you can check to see whether the clock and the processor is working. That's D5, D6, and then we just need D7. I did have a, a separate little breadboard, but I reused the breadboard for that. So I might make myself a little pluggable no-op board that will allow me to do this. So what I have done is the grounds are plugged second one in, the, the five volts plugged in there. So uh, hopefully I can see that that is D4, D1. So that's one, two hexadecimal. So we also then need to plug in the Q and the E signals from the, the output over here. So the E signal is blue and is coming from the Q signal from there. So this is the E, and then we'll also do the Q signal, which comes from the K line there. Okay, so that's the that should be the circuit wired up. So just check it. We've got the reset. It's going to reset. We've got three state control held to low. We've got 
that there. What I will need to do as well is my logic probe. I've wired, I've put on my logic probe, I've put the sort of eight way connected in here to make it a bit easier to plug in. And normally when you've got buses and things, they're normally done in eights. The only issue here is that um, these three pins are just snuck around the corner. So I'm just going to put in these wires so I can plug in the logic probe more easily around the side there. So let's just put those in. And all I've got to do is to put the logic analyzer in here. So the main thing I'm going to do is to be looking for the, the address lines. So I've got, this is the channel zero to seven for the address line. So just need to make sure this goes to ground somewhere and purple is one, a uh, zero. Purple is zero. Just stick that in and wire it up to ground. Then the next set of address lines, channel eight through to 15. And again, you just need to plug these in. And because I've now wired these upper three address lines in there, that will just go in much more easily. Wire in that. Now we'll also, although the, um, the data line is going to be, should be one, two hexadecimal, I will just wire in the data line just so we can see all of the data all at the same time, make sure I've got the right values in there. So if we just plug the data in there and that goes to, and then finally, there's a couple of spare leads that I've got. So I've already got the clock and the Q and the E signals already uh, plugged in. Yeah, I'm just going to check the inkst logic analyzer to see which other ones we want. So reset is gray. So we're going to plug. I think what I'll do is I'm going to plug these into the leads at the other side, which is probably going to be easier. So blue goes to E. Green goes to Q. Then gray is going to reset. Then red is going to five volts. So that just means we can tell when the thing is powered on and trigger that. Brown is going to go to read write. And then orange is bus available BA and yellow is bus status. So those are some lines that tell us whether or not the process is in reset or whatever. So if we just zoom into that. Okay, so hopefully you can see that we've wired up all the various control lines. So now we're just going to run up the logic analyzer. So switch back over to screen share. So this is the 32 channel logic analyzer, this is LA5032. It's quite expensive, but I found that using two 16 channel ones was a bit fiddly because when you want to look at all the address signals, all the data signals and all the control signals, then you have to kind of uh, put the two side by side and trying to correlate the two and it makes things quite, quite awkward. So, this is going to be triggered on the five volts. So this will start recording as soon as I switch the power on. And we will see that there'll be quite a, a gray area of the reset in that the voltage at which the 6809 comes out of reset is four volts, but the voltage at which the logic analyzer thinks is high is 1.58 volts. So in fact, we'll see that there will be a bus status, bus acknowledge signal when it acknowledges the reset will appear a fair way after the logic analyzer says that reset has come high. So we'll run this up. We're using um, 200 million samples at 200 megahertz. So it's quite fast, but that should be about a second. If I had a short and a smaller number of samples here, then it may not record long enough to be able to see the interesting part. So we'll just run that there. And I'm now just gonna plug in the five volt line 
So that looks like we've got decent signal. If we look down the bottom here, we can see that, as I said, the reset has this sort of indeterminate phase for a period of time and then comes high. But in fact, the bus status acknowledge, sort of the acknowledgement of the reset happens actually quite a bit further on. So it's, it's occurring probably about 100 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds into after power on. And then we can see here that the data is 0, 0 and then uh, very quickly goes to 0, 12 and then that will be 0, 12 from then on. And we can also see over here that the address bus starts with FFFE then FFF F, which is the reset vector, and because the address that it gets from the reset vector will be 1212, then the address counter, the program counter, will then start at 1212, and then will actually work its way up from there. So you can see here that it's then working its way all the way up, and if we scroll through here, we can sort of see it goes up through the 7080, all the way up to F trying to get to there we go so if we just go back a little we can see here it goes all the way up to FFFF -F -F -F, and then trips over to 00, zero and starts from from one again so the reason why it starts from 1212 is because that's what the reset vector comes back as because that's the no op code so this looks like it's, it seems to be working properly you can see that the point at where this kicks in is about I think 90 milliseconds is where it comes out of reset we can see that the pink there is our main clock which is running at 4 megahertz at the moment so it's still running on the slightly slower speed and you can see that the address lines are going through as we'd expect so this all appears to be working okay and so it means that our clock circuit should be okay now to fit into the main nanocomp board so what I'm going to do now is to update the schematic diagram with the circuit that we've got here well I will take out the memory ready circuit so if you see here at the moment I've actually got the memory ready so this is the delay circuit so if we need to stretch a particular clock cycle for slower components then we can do that using this but in fact because there's a much more complicated diagram that I showed earlier and this one really won't do what we need it to do for a device that can't work at the high frequency so I'm just going to keep it simple for the moment which means these two signals get wired to 5 volts and we'll do that in the uh, the diagram and then if we need to do the more complex circuit to get the CRTC working then we will do so so here's the updated schematic, so it's now at version 14 and if we just um, zoom into here we can see that this has now got upgrade to the 6.8 BO9 CPU at 8 megahertz stroke 2 megahertz uh, clock cycle. So if I go up to the area of the CPU here, so you can see here we've now got the 6.8 BO9E so the pins are the same down the left hand side and up here it's only this this region here where they're different and the clock crystal has gone from here and moved up to the top so this is our clock circuit so this is using the 74 HCT14 so this is a TTL compatible but CMOS modern uh, chip and I was only able to get this oscillator with this particular design working with this version rather than the standard LSTTL. I really would need to look into the uh, clock oscillators in a bit more detail and understand a bit better. I'm, I'm not really that familiar with it at the moment, so I wouldn't really like to provide too much advice other than that this appears to work. And the output of this Schmidt inverter there is then used to feed into the JK flip-flop here. So this is our... 74LS109 which is kind of a almost replacement of the 7476 and the output here the clock goes into the two JK flip-flop clock signals here and then if we look at the diagram here we can see that we're not making use of the top circuit so the clear and preset are, are held to 5 volts as is the other preset and clear here so those are five volts and then the main issue we have here is that 
where Q bar is connected to K, because K is in fact inverted, then in fact we would use Q to go to K, and also Q going to J as well. And when we look at the feedback here, so Q currently goes to K, but in fact, because K is inverted, what we actually need to do is to take the Q bar and actually feed that round. So effectively that then means that Q bar is going both to K bar and J in fact. So it actually simplifies things a little bit. We're actually taking the Q signal off of the second J input and the E signal going off to the rest of the system as a TTL value comes off the Q output. The key thing to note here is that because the input to the 6809E needs not TTL levels, but actually MOS, CMOS levels. And so this circuit means that the E signal is pulled very close to 5 volts by default. And then when this transistor is given a high output, it actually grounds it. So in fact, the output to this transistor needs to be from the inverted output of here. So Q goes off to the rest of the system as a TTL level, and then this inverted Q goes off to this transistor circuit to make sure that the voltage level in the input to the E signal is correct. So if we go back to KiCad, we can see then that we look at the J and the K input is actually fed back to the Q bar, and the J and K for the second one is actually output to Q. And then if we look at the main uh, E circuit, so this is the main bus E, which is TTL compatible, that comes out of Q. And if we look at the CPU E, that actually comes out of two bar there and then goes down to our transistor inverter circuit. So because this is actually Q bar coming out of here, by the time it goes through this, it inverts it. And so this should actually be in phase with the main E signal. And finally, the Q signal comes out of the output of the J. So the flip-flop 2 is in fact the Q signal and the Q signal then goes off to the rest of the board here. So Q and the CPUE signals are wired in here. And other than that, then there shouldn't really be any more significant changes to the rest of the circuit. And then what we will be doing uh, after this is updating the, the communications controller and the peripheral interface adapter. And we'll hope that this CRTC chip is able to work at our higher frequency. Otherwise, we're going to have to do some more changes to get this to actually work with the 8 megahertz clock. OK, so before we add the changes to the board, I'm just checking that everything's working OK. So I've powered on the Nanocomp. You can see we've got the prompt there. If we go into memory 000, you can see the display and keypad's working. And what I'm just going to do now is to load on the test programs. I was going to show the Doom uh, image that we used in the 256 color graphics. So if we just go to the VGA capture, so you can see at the moment we've got the Nanocomp default sort of startup. And all I'm going to do now is to put this into load mode. So you're going to hit load here. And then I'm going to download the test program. So this is test 256C3SREC. So hopefully what you'll see there is once this is finished, it will come up with F for finished. If there was an error, then it would come up with E for error. OK, uh, so I'm just going to run that the first time. Now that won't really do very much for the moment. And now we're just going to load the Doom image. And we'll switch back over to the VGA capture. You'll see that uh, the VGA palette won't have been initialized yet. If I now download the Doom image, this will not have the correct palette yet, so it will probably appear a bit odd. And as you see, this is not got the correct palette. And if I rerun the test program, what that will do is load the palette 
that's been downloaded into memory from this Doom image, it will load the palette. And then next time we download the Doom image, it should actually come out in the correct color palette and everything will look fine. So this file is about 175K. So it's quite a big file for this serial interface to be downloading. So once that has finished, we will just rerun the program again. Which will clear the screen as well. Okay, so that's cleared the screen. But what we've now done is initialize the color palette. So if we download the Doom image again, we should now find that it's coming out in the correct colors. So this is really testing that not only the serial communications, that the graphics chip is working as well. So CRTC is working. So this is hammering the video circuits quite a lot for doing this. So that appears to be working OK. So what we're going to do now is to add in the clock circuit and pull out the original 6809 processor and plug in our faster version. So I've printed out a region of the schematic. So you can see we've got the oscillator up here, which is going to be on this 74HCT14. And this is feeding into the 74LS109JK flip-flop. These figure, these will then be feeding the rest of the board E and Q signals. And then we're going to need to put in the transistor and the little circuit here for doing the CPU E signal. So I'm going to wire these into a board on the side here. So I'm just going to put this board on the side, put in a breadboard buddy power rail down the bottom there. So we'll put the, um, the clock circuit and the flip-flops around here, and then uh, it won't uh, break anything too much here. At least we could then be able to resort back to the original one should we need to. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to speed this up. So as I do it, I'll commentate over it and we'll come back in a few minutes once this is all wired up. Okay, so just wiring in the breadboard and we'll insert the 74HCT14 Schmidt trigger inverters, put in the power and decoupling capacitor, then put in the crystal, then we need to put in the two capacitors, either 22 PF capacitors on either, tying each of the crystal inputs to the ground, and we need to put in the one mega ohm resistor and the 47 ohm resistor and then the 68 ohm resistor which i put wrong as the 47 one on the diagram there now we're putting in the flip flop the 74 ls 109 put in the power and the decoupling capacitor there we go Now we need to put in the pull-ups for the set and preset. So they all go to five volts. Check those off. So now we need to wire in the clock output from the inverter down to the one clock and the two clock signal. We need the wired in. Now we're going to wire the J and K bar inputs on both of the flip-flops together. Now the output from Q bar goes to the 1JK and the output from 1Q goes to the 2JK bar. Now we're going to wire in the feed for the CPU E signal using the transistor driver. And these are just the outputs for the CPU Q. So I did a quick test with the transistor driver circuit for the CPU E signal, and I had all sorts of problems. One of the issues was that the resistor values in the documentation would have been requiring more current from the flip-flop chip than it was capable of doing. And I went back to the data sheet and checked things. And then obviously that one of the things I forgot is we're using an HCT inverter gate here which actually produces very close to five volt output levels which is what the requirement was so what i've done now is i've changed the output here so previously we were feeding the 2q that bar into the transistor circuit and inverted it so all i'm doing now is using one of the spare gates that i had here 
and this is now the eCPU. So it's a, it's a lot simpler and we're running into all sorts of problems with uh, current and waveform and various other things with that transistor approach. So this is a much cleaner approach and it just means now that that eCPU signal should now be very close to 5 volts. In fact, it's on the scope I've checked it and it's it's about half a volt or more higher than the, the other values. So that really should be okay. And then if we go to the logic analyzer, I've just run this and you can see here that we've got four megahertz clock. We've got our E clock, which is one megahertz at the moment. We're still running at four megahertz. Got a Q clock. And then the eCPU really down here is, is our value that's coming out of the inverter. The only slight issue is that there may be a slight delay. So if we put these two markers here, so there's actually potentially a gap of perhaps up to 25 nanoseconds. So if we try running this at 500 megahertz and see how this runs. So if we now try putting the markers in and see what the gap is. So it's E and our E CPU. What's that gap now? Still 24 nanoseconds. So that might give us an issue, something we need to be aware of, aware of but um, it was so unreliable, the, the transistor approach wasn't working. And when I worked out that the output current could be 0 0.4 milliamps uh, driven from the chip and the fact that the value that was chosen was using about one and a half milliamps, we would need to change the resistor to about 15k and in the end it was it was more trouble than it's worth so this hopefully there's a slight delay on this but this signal is going to be going through the e signal will be going through a buffer anyway so i suspect if we actually compare the ecpu and the buffered signal they'll probably be very very close that's something that you'll be aware of in the future so that's that seems to be working okay so what i'm going to do now is to swap out the CPU and switch over the signals. So we've got rid of the transistor circuit here and replaced it now with the with one of the spare gates from the HCT chip because this actually works at sort of close to five volt levels. I've also uh, corrected the resistor value up here. So basically we need to wire this in now and um, I'm going to replace the chip first and then we'll un unplug some of the wires that are no longer needed and um, we'll plug in the EQ signals and the system E signal as well. Okay so we'll take the current processor out and put in the E version, make sure that's seated in. So now we're going to take out the original feed for the E signal out to the buffers, take out some of the tie-ups to 5 volts which we don't need anymore. We'll also do the TSC to ground, check those off. So now we need to feed the in the extra inverter that we need to replace the transistor driver. It's the output to the Q, CPU Q. This is the system E drive going direct to the buffer. Okay, so I've uh, checked the connections and everything seems to be okay. So we've got our new clock circuit wired in here and I think I've got the right connections over here as well. So just going to power it on and then we'll rerun our Doom download test, the Doom image. So that has actually come on and reset okay. So what I'm going to do now is to put it into load and we're going to download the Doom test program. I'll speed up the next sequences so we can sort of try loading the Doom image twice. First with the wrong palette information, second time with the correct palette information.
Okay, so that appears to have worked okay. So now we can go on to the next step. So we can see according to our plan, we've just step three, step four, and now I've done step five, test an anacomp keyboard, LED display, serial port and video controller at four megahertz. So now we're gonna try replacing the serial controller and test the serial port at four megahertz. So let's go on and do that. Okay, so hopefully the correct wires I've plugged back in there. So we'll power it on again and now see if we can download something into the nanocomp. Okay, so the power's come back on. Go into load and we'll just send down the test program again. We should get an F on the display if it's finished, yes. So that has loaded successfully. And if we run it, get some output on the debug console so that has run successfully so that's good so we'll have a look at what the next step is so we've tested the serial controller so now we're going to do the peripheral interface adapter and if the keypad and led display works then we should be good turn the power off okay so that's the peripheral interface adapter so if we power this on and we've got the display coming back so memory zero zero yep so that all appears to be working so the next step now and this is a bit that is probably going to result in things not working is to replace the crystal and see if everything's working so now I'm just going to swap out the four megahertz crystal so let's just make sure the power's off yes so the four megahertz crystal I'm going to swap this out with the 8 megahertz one. Make sure we put it in the right hole. Yep. Just going to switch that on. And that seems to have come up okay. That's good. We just look at memory 000. Yep. That's working. And if I just put the oscilloscope probe on here, we can have a quick check at the frequency. So if we just switch over to the main screen, so here's the oscilloscope PC integration. So you can see this is the clock signal and we can see down the bottom that it's eight megahertz. So let's have a look and see if the video card is working. So we'll look at the VGA capture and that has actually come up okay. So that's great. So that's good news that we didn't need to do any special timing for the uh, 68A45 compatible chip to actually work at eight megahertz. So let's just run up the test program again. So I'll speed up the loading of the image. The image is 175K, so it's the serial communications, which is the bottleneck, not the actual processor speed. So I'll speed up the loading of it so we don't have to spend too long doing that. So great, that's the 8 megahertz version has loaded the image quite happily. So the whole thing seems to be working at 8 megahertz with the upgraded chips and the CRTC controller seems to be happy working at the higher speeds. So if we just go back and have a look at the plan. So we've now completed step number nine, testing the Nanocomp serial port and video controller, and we didn't actually have to fix any issues. So that's good. So we finished step 20, upgrading the CPU to the 68B09E, and this has required us to put in the extra clock circuits and to get it working at 8 megahertz. It's good to see that the CRTC works at this higher frequency, even though it's not designed to actually work at 8 megahertz, only 6 megahertz. In the next video, what I'll be doing is looking to see if we can integrate the Nanocomp with a hard disk. I've got an old 2.5 inch SATA portable drive and an SD card adapter as well and what I'll be doing is see if I can get the Nanocomp to be able to read data off of the hard disks. So if you don't want to miss out on future videos please hit subscribe and if you found the content interesting please hit like and feel free to leave any comments I generally get back to comments within a day or so. Thanks for watching.